A blessed Wednesday evening everyone and my name is Brother Rommel Butawan and I am one of the primary leaders of Pastor Doc and Pastor Ashe. Tonight we welcome you to our Wednesday Bible study and we will be studying on 2 Peter chapter 3. And I would like to thank the Lord for um, this opportunity and of course I would like to thank my leaders, my pastor Bishop um, Godofredo Ambat and Pastor Ashe Ambat for allowing me to uh, share with you uh, this uh, lesson about 2 Peter chapter 3. So, but before we dive in for tonight, I would like everyone to uh, open their hearts and uh, as we pray, let the Holy Spirit speak to us. So let's bow our heads. Father God in heaven, we are grateful that you are our God. We are thankful, Lord, that um, we can call you Abba Father. And tonight, Lord, we continue to ask uh, for your forgiveness of our sins, that whatever hinders us from learning your word tonight, Lord, we apply the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to continue to infill us with your presence you are our teacher tonight and we ask you to lead us in righteousness allow each and everyone who are watching and listening to this bible study that they will have an encounter with you and through your word tonight there will be transformation there will be lives that will be saved in jesus mighty name amen so, good evening everyone, and um, tonight, this is na the second letter of Peter, and um, we are actually studying from 2 Peter chapter 3. So, the second letter of Peter might be subtitled, The School for Christians. We have been studying it from this point of view in 2 Peter chapter 1, we look at the various lessons that Christians need to learn in the school for Christians. And in chapter 2, we considered that uh, we considered the teachers in the school for Christians. Chapter 3 tells us that one day, one day school will end. And I heard a lovely story of a little boy who was sent off to school at the age of five for his first day. Can you imagine that? And at 4 o'clock, the teacher said, You can go home now. He stared in disbelief and then he said, My dad said I was here for 10 years. When you are at school, it seems to stretch ahead. Homework seems eternal. And you think you will never get away from it. But one day, school ends. And at the end of school, there is usually an examination. There will come a day then when school closes down, this world as we knew it will disappear and we will have finished our time of learning. God will test us to see how much we have learned while we have been in the school for Christians. But how will school end? Ringing a bell? Well, a trumpet is going to sound, but there is also a disaster that is going to end school. The school of this world is going to end tragically, disastrously, unexpectedly, and Peter is talking about this and telling us to be ready for the day the school goes. First of all, he talks about the promise. The promise is that one day there will come the day of the Lord. That phrase occurs many times in the words of the Old Testament prophets and many times in the New Testament. What does it mean? It means that people have had their day and one day God is going to have his day. Other little men have had their day and cease to be, but God's day has yet to come. God has never really had his day on this earth. 
And one day, the day of the Lord will come, and that, he says, will have to be obeyed. So the Bible looks forward to the day of the Lord, which is which may be much longer than a day of 24 hours. That is what a day is to me. But a day to the Lord is very different. That day includes at least three events. Event number one will be the coming of the Lord. In the Old Testament, they thought that meant Yahweh that they look for. The day that He would come, we now know about this more fully. We know, we now know that the day of the Lord, when the Lord comes, is the day of Jesus' coming. One thing is absolute, absolutely certain, that Jesus is going to step right back into this planet, a uh, planet of ours. The question is, are you ready to meet Him? The coming of the Lord is the first event Peter mentions here. And that's the first event. And the second event he mentions, which is part of the coming day of the Lord, is the end of the world. That used to be scoffed at. In the 19th century, people said, <clears throat> the end of the world? Ridiculous. But since the two world wars of the 20th century, People don't laugh at this idea anymore. <clears throat> Some young people will tell you they doubt if they will live in that to die in their beds of their old age. The end of the world is terribly real now, indeed, even among people who are not Christians. There is a sense of things building up to some huge crisis or crisis, some great disaster. They are right too. Things are building up. You don't need to try to persuade people today that the end of the world would come. Nor need you persuade them that it could happen in the way that Peter describes in this chapter, which we will come to later. The third event which he mentioned as part of the day of the Lord is something that nobody in the world even dreams could happen. Those who believe could not be those who believe this world can come by chance could not believe this third thing because statistically it this just couldn't have happened again by chance. It is a new heaven and a new earth, a whole new universe with new space, new planets and it, and only the Christians knows about this. Uh, this one. So Peter talks about a new world. If you want to find the part of the Bible that talks about God's creation, read the first three pages of the last three pages and the last three pages. You will be astonished. It is like reading the same thing all over again. It says in um, uh, in Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is the first page. Read the second, last page. And it says in Revelation, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had passed away. So we have seen that there are three events about which Peter is teaching us. I want you to know that Jesus used the world or the word regeneration of two different connections. He said to an individual, you must be born again. Individuals must be regenerated, given a new life, made all over again. But he also used the word regeneration of the universe. Just as individual needs to be need to be born again, so the universe is going to be born again. God is going to regenerate the whole thing. The people he is giving new life to are just the beginning of a new creation, which will reach to the fortieth limits of space. What a conception! The whole thing is going to be reborn. 
the whole thing is going to be regenerated. One day, you will just see a big, a big bonfire and a new universe arising from the ashes. That then, in the, that then is the promise. We come secondly to what I call the prediction. The crucial question, when is this going to happen? This year? Next year? Sometime? Never? And there are three groups of people around. The number one is the fanatics who say, this year, next year. And the scoffers, the second one who say, never. And the believer who say, sometime. When I say fanatics, I mean those who try to improve on God's word and date the day of the Lord. It can't be done. There are still some signs of the time of the times that have not yet appeared. There are also those who panic people. I remember hearing of some who led a group of people to climb a hill in Somerset and wait for the Lord's coming. Jesus said this sort of thing would be liable to happen. Don't listen to them, he said. You will all know when it has really come if you are watching and praying remember we are all encouraged to attend and participate and engage in our 24-hour prayer um, chain so if you are watching and if you are praying i'm sure you will be able to know when it will it will come well, don't listen to the fanatics who will give you dates. That is not the way to do it. But at the other end are those coffers who say, Never, there's no sign of His coming. Everything is continuing as usual. There is no sign, whatever, that there is going to be a climax to history. We'll be here for another million years. And we'll just go on and on and on. They are guilty of the disease euphoria. That is the, <clears throat> the disease of saying to yourself, it can never happen. You hear of road accidents and you say, it could never happen to me. You see that the burglars have been in a, in a house three doors away and you say, it could never happen to me. You hear of someone stricken with a, with a disease that can't be cured and you say, it could never happen to me. But sometimes it does happen. What does Peter have to say to people like this? First, it has happened once, so why shouldn't it happen again? God has already once brought a whole era to an end. He has already once removed a whole society from the face of the earth. He did it with water then, but he did it and a whole society vanished. If he has done it once, why could he not do it twice? Peter got this argument from Jesus himself because Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days when the Son of Man comes again. Here is the second thing Peter teaches. Do you realize the first time God destroyed the world, He did it with an element already in it called water? He didn't need it to create anything new to do it. The water was there. It was there in the sky. It was there in the ocean. We are told two things happened in Noah's day. The rain came down in a cloud burst and the land must have been so disturbed that it sunk because it says the waters of the ocean rush in. The combination of uh, the water from above and the water from below wipe out a whole society. <clears throat> The new element he is going to use is not water, but this time it's fire. 
the fire is already there. He doesn't need to introduce any more or introduce anything new. It is only a few years since a scientist said that if we knew how to start the right kind of chain reaction, the whole universe would burn up in a fire in 40 minutes. So if a scientist says that, then he's just catching up with God. God would, God would not need to create anything new. Every atom is made up of energy that could dissolve in fire. So if we could release it, and God would just need to start the event. Peter says that the same God who said he would destroy the earth by water he has said he would destroy it by fire. You have the same word. One of the frightening things about the Bible is that God means that God means what he says. Now, here is the second group of scoffers who say, Oh, it will never happen. It's all right. You can go on forever. The world will always be there. But it won't. However, the true believer neither falls into the panic group who says, This year, next year, and starts getting all excited. Nor does he fall into the scoffer category, saying, Oh, it will never happen in my lifetime. What he says is, it is going to happen sometime. It may seem slow. It may seem as if God is waiting an awfully uh, long time. But there are three things at any rate that we need to remember. First, uh, firstly, time is different to God. How God feels about the time since Jesus died? A couple of days? To God, who has been there always, a thousand years is just like breakfast to supper time. So to God, it doesn't seem a long time. That is the first thing to get into your head. Two thousand years is only a couple of days to God. Secondly, there is a reason why God is delaying this. A reason why He is keeping school open. A reason why He is keeping us in after time. For in a sense, we wish He had closed down the school long before now. The reason is this. He wants more people in His family. He wants more people to repent. And could come to him every day. God gives us is a day when something like 25,000 more people find Christ. And God wants that. He doesn't want to destroy everyone. He doesn't rejoice to the death of a wicked. Every day he gives you another day to repent. That is why he seems to us to be slow. It is actually his mercy. Thank God that He hasn't drawn the curtain before now on world history. We have an opportunity to come to God because He gave us another day. And the third reason is that even if apparently there are no signs of His coming, even if it doesn't seem like tomorrow, remember that His coming is, is like a thief in the night. And if you had known the burglar was coming, you would have stayed awake. You would have stayed watch. You would have sat up and waited for the first sign of his coming. So, Peter says, watch. The Christian who is watching will not be caught out. A Christian who is awake and alert will hear, will see will know that Christ is coming. It is only those who are asleep who will suddenly find the burglar has come. The day of the Lord will be upon them like a thief in the night. What about the practice of all this? Is it relevant to daily life? 
Some people say, if you concentrate on the second coming and the future you are living by in the sky and then die when you die, or you're heavenly minded and no earthly use. Is that true? I don't think so. There are three things that will happen to someone who is looking for the day of the Lord. Firstly, he will wait for it. James says he will wait like a farmer waits for the harvest. You can't be impatient with the harvest. Me, I experienced how to farm and I knew. You can keep going out and when you see a bit of green, pull it up to see how the roots are doing and push it back in. See, when you have sown the corn, you must wait patiently. A Christian doesn't get all panicky and excited about the second coming, but he waits patiently for it and he watches the sign of the harvest day or the harvest day coming. Waiting is the first reaction. Secondly, Hastening the day. There is some doubt about the translation here and I am not surprised by that. Some early copies of the New Testament have changed the word hastening to something else. I think they changed it because they found the idea just too difficult. Peter wrote hastening the day of his coming. It was changed to hastening towards the day of his coming. Hasting to the day of his coming. Let us go back to what I believe Peter wrote. It is in my hands to hasten the day of the Lord. Here I am, torn between two. I know that the longer it is, the, it is, the more people have a chance to repent. And yet, you know, I want you to bring it nearer to get into that new heaven and earth. How do I resolve this tension? By bringing in the lost ones. The more the church gets on with its job, winning the lost, the nearer that day can come. God has said that we must make disciples of all the nations. Then the end will come. He wants a family with every representations or representation of race and clan and tribe. We are to get on with that that he will bring his day. So you can see why God is holding the day off in order that all nation might respond. It is within our power to bring that day nearer when there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. What a motive to get on with evangelism. Bible translators emphasize this because they knew or they know they are hastening the day of his coming. A Christian will wait, will hasten, and thirdly, will prepare for it. The exam is coming so you can so you want to be ready <clears throat> those who emphasize the second coming properly and those who look forward to the future are those who will say since all these things are thus to be dissolved what matter of people ought we to be it has a direct effect on your daily living our church building will one day be demolished everybody will have Gone off to meet the Lord. That could be your first trip to the Holy Land. And you will meet the Lord and look down on the Mount of Olives with Him. What a great hope. I had an aunt who was always getting her last piece of furniture. She used to say that that's my last stair carpet. I won't need another. I bought my last this and my last that if everything on earth is going to be dissolved in fire we must not be the kind of people whose hearts 
are getting attached to the things that will be burned up or we will be terribly upset and we will lose. Our hearts should be set with affection on the things that are above, where Christ is, so that when the bonfire comes, nothing that we cherish goes. What kind of people ought we to be? We ought to be the kind of people who will come out at the end of the, sc of the school with honors in God's test. Peter says, there are two ways in which you can get ready. First, or firstly, all manner of holy living. And secondly, be at peace with one another. Wouldn't it be terrible if the Lord came for his church and found the church member at odds with each other? Wouldn't we feel ashamed if we were just having a row with someone and Jesus stepped out of the clouds and there we were. So let us be at peace with one another, that he may, he may be pleased when he comes. That is the practice of it. And finally, we must preach this. The apostles did. Peter has some lovely remarks here about Paul's letter. He says they are a bit difficult to understand sometimes. People can twist them, but he tells us that he and Paul say, say the same thing, never set over against its other, the writers of the New Testament. They all say exactly the same thing. They all say Jesus is coming back. They all say that school will close. They all say the trumpet will sound. They all look forward to a new heaven and new earth. They all have the same message. I am quite sure somebody had come to Peter and said, Paul doesn't say that uh, what you're saying. And he says, Paul does. You are twisting his words. If you, if you don't see that there, read all the apostles, read John, Peter, Paul, they also they all say the same thing they all tell you what is going to happen in the future so listen to them so in conclusion there are certain things a christian must not change and there are certain things a christian must change first his beliefs about the future Peter warns against being carried away with the mistakes of those who say, Where is the promise of his coming? Don't be upset or disturbed by those who twist the teachings of Scripture and by how much in the last hundred years the teaching of the Bible has been twisted about the last days. To prove this, that and the other, don't be upset. Don't be misled. But the thing that ought to change is this, that you should grow in the grace, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. That defines the limits. The Bible puts strict limits to your beliefs inside apostolic beliefs. Peter, Paul, and John taught the same thing and we must step outside the circle of their beliefs. That must not change, but within the circle, we can grow up within the ideas. You go or you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. That is the more, the, that, that is more than a head knowledge. It is a heart knowledge, a personal relationship. And that concludes our Bible study tonight. And I hope and pray that all the things that you have heard, that you have learned, will not remain a head knowledge, but it will continue to transform our lives. So before we end, let me close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the words that has been spoken. And we believe, Lord, that everything that has been spoken tonight it will not return empty, but it will accomplish its purpose. 
So right now, we apply the blood of Jesus to those who are who have uh, come and listen to this Bible study, and let it be um, done according to your plan. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that you have used me uh, to share this um, a Bible study tonight. Thank you, and all the glory belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So, everyone, thank you and have a blessed Wednesday, Wednesday evening.